So greetings from uh, uh, Christ the King Free Lutheran Church in Pipestone, where we come from, that area where we live near Marshall. I'm Steve Qualley. Uh, my wife Glenda is not able to be with me here today, but we are missionaries on loan from uh, the AFLC to Wycliffe Bible Translators. We've been invited back in 2008 to be with the uh, missionary on loan status by Del Palmer, and we've enjoyed very much sharing uh, the vision and mission of Bible translation through AFLC churches all around the territory. Just last yesterday, we were at the WMF conference up in uh, near Argyle, Minnesota, which is way up well, about an hour south of Roseau, so it's, it's, it was a bit of a trip. But uh, we're glad to be here. The Lord was good and gave us a good trip. So we want to thank you for uh, being a missions-minded church. Uh, it was very encouraging to hear the, the hymns this morning, and I see the last one is going to be a good one too. Uh, and Pastor Carl, that, that beginning scripture you read out of Corinthians, that's one of my favorite verses. It's, it's been part of one of my sermons that I share uh, when I have enough time to be able to do that. So thank you for sharing that verse. I grew up on a farm here uh, near uh, Morris, Minnesota, so this isn't too far from my old stomping grounds. We got down to Wilmer once in a while and we'd go to the, the candy mall. It was really a big deal for us. Um, and when I grew my, I have a younger brother that uh, was about a year younger than I am, and we would uh, watch our mom make homemade bread. And she had one of these things in the kitchen called a flour bin. And you don't see them much in houses anymore because that's what Tupperwares are for and, and stuff like that. Well, it was a bin. You could dump about you know, 25, 50 pounds of flour in. You'd, you'd flip it out and you'd scoop out your, your flour and knead the dough right there on the breadboard. And, and homemade bread, that was the best stuff. Well, we, my brother and I, four or five years old, we thought that was a pretty good looking sandbox too, that flour bin. <laughs> So one day while my mom was gone, we took the family cat and we put it in the flower bin, you know, put flower on it. Ever seen, you know, green blinking eyes with a white kitty? And, and while we were doing that, we, we saw mom drive into the yard and we thought, well, we better try to clean this one up. So we tried to wash it off and it, <laughs> it didn't turn out so good. <laughs> cat prints in the, in the uh, flower bin and a messy cat. So like maybe a paper mache one if we would have got a little bit of paper to go with it. Um, yeah, yeah. So that was a dairy farm up there northeast of uh, Morris, Minnesota there where I grew up. And we now live near Marshall, Minnesota. And so it was just an, a, less than a two-hour drive to get up here. And it's a privilege to be here to share about the mis ministry and mission of Bible translation. Uh, I'd like to tell you about Karen. Uh, she was a translator to the Philippines. And when she and her ministry partner went out to the remote rural village where foreigners were rarely seen, all of a sudden they were just surrounded by the villagers. And they started commenting on their appearances. And they said, boy, they have big noses. Look, they've got hair on their arms. And one attractive young teenage girl said, your eyebrows need to be plucked. <laughs> but, and, and the lady later came up to her and said, you're so fat. You're fatter than in your pictures. And, and Karen, it took her a few living in the village for a while to realize that they weren't being unkind, but rather the total opposite thing was true. To talk about one's appearances was a compliment. It was a way to be friendly and to, uh, to make conversation. And later she learned to be, if you were told that you were fat, it meant you were well, you were vital, and you were healthy. So I'd like you to imagine that someday as believers, we'll be on the other side of glory, welcoming believers into the kingdom of God, who we were able to help come to know Christ. What a glory to rejoice with the angels, and I'll tell you how. Wickless vision is that God's word is accessible to all people in a language that speaks to their heart. And its mission is to have a translation project started in every language that still needs it by the year 2025. Now, there are about 7,000 known languages in the world today, including about 375 known sign languages, and there's currently 1,636 languages that are still waiting for a translation project to even get started. Now, praise God, there's about 2,500 languages, projects going on worldwide where Bible translation is taking place, and 
about 80% of those is Wycliffe has some involvement in, whether they got translators or translation advisors or consultants or some part of the project they're involved in. So Wycliffe uh, has a great presence out there in Bible translation. We're excited to share those tools as well with other um, Bible translation organizations such as Lutheran Bible Translators. They use the tools that Wycliffe's developed, and we like to share those because we're not in competition, but we're out there to help bring the gospel to every people that's still waiting Wycliffe was founded by Cameron Townsend. Uh, he was uh, going to enter into World War I back in 1917 as a soldier. And, and God um, directed his paths from that to being a missionary to sell Spanish Bibles in Guatemala. And when he was there, the, the uh, Quechuaquel Indians there said, well, we don't understand Spanish very well, but if your God is so great, why can't he speak our language? And that really cut to his heart. And so he went about translating the Bible, in the, in the New Testament, into their language. And in about 10 years, he had gotten that completed. As a gifted linguist, without any real formal training, God led him and directed him through that translation process. And he realized, I can't do this by myself. There's thousands of other languages out there. So he founded an organization called Summer Institute of Linguistics to train other trans people to do translation and language development work. And now for 75 years, Wycliffe Bible Translators has uh, been working to promote that effort to Bible translation. And we recently completed the 1,000th New Testament that was completed. Cameron Townsend had a saying. Uh, he said that the Bible in the mother tongue is the greatest missionary. It's never considered a foreigner, and it doesn't need a furlough. Now, I have a, a Bible here I'm going to show you, uh, explain what it's like not to have the Bible in your language. I hope you can understand that. My wife usually does this, but since she's not here today, I get to do it. Um, I'll show you what it's like. If you don't have the Bible in the language you understand at all, whether it's a trade language, and you, you've never heard of it, you don't know what it's in it, the Bible's going to look like this. There's, you don't get anything out of it. Now, Let's say you have the Bible in a trade language, and that's like a language of wider communication. Like here we might speak, um, uh, I don't know, spiceries maybe, and <laughs> willeries, right? But in order to communicate, we've got to use English so we can do business between the different groups. Well, that's all a trade language. So if you have a trade language and you, you can understand that, it's not your language you were born speaking, dreaming, worshiping in. And the Bible's going to look more like this. You get some black and white pictures of it, but you're still missing a lot of the meaning of it. So when a Bible translation finally comes to your language, your one <coughs> speaking, all of a sudden the Bible comes to life in full color, and you can understand what God is saying to you at a much more intimate level. And that's what with the Bible translators is all about, just to bring the Bible to life in that way. I'd like to tell you about Biano. Biano was one of the men who helped translate the Kalinga New Testament in the Philippines. Well, when Neville Thomas, the translator, was getting ready to go home on furlough to Australia, he asked uh, Biano a question. He said, Biano, we've translated 75% of the New Testament, and during all this time, you've asked questions until you understood, but you've never asked questions because you didn't believe it. You just read it and believe it. Where I come from in Australia, we have to argue with people about the very existence of God before we even talk about the Bible. But you just read it and believe it. Why is that? Well, Biano looked shocked that Neville would even ask him such a question. Neville, he said, if I wake up in the middle of the night in my house, it's pitch black and I can't see a thing. I have to feel around on the floor for a match. I have to light the match and light the kerosene the wick in my kerosene lamp comes up, the fire burns, and I can see what I want. Well, during all this translation process, it's as if someone has lit up a light inside my head. For the first time, I can see who God is. Why wouldn't I believe it? I'd like to share a little video now um, called The Road to Transformation. <laughs> I think Bible translation is a simple process of word substitution. It's much more than that. It's a rigorous process of bringing the word of God to people who may never otherwise receive the hope of the gospel. It's complicated and challenging, 
an immense responsibility. More art than science. A calling. Wycliffe sends language surveyors to be first on the scene. They figure out things like whether or not the people need a translation, if the location is safe, and what the culture is like. Every language brings a new challenge. Every culture, a unique worldview. As a result, there are times when the community isn't ready for translation. In these cases, our translators do whatever is necessary to build gateways of trust. This usually happens through building relationships and serving the community with projects, like digging wells or providing health care. As we serve the community, we also look for local translators, people who have grown up in that culture and know the language best. They'll work alongside Wycliffe's trained consultants who supervise and guide the translation process. Some communities may need an alphabet and a written language before the team can even start translating. That may still not be enough. The road to spiritual freedom is long and winding. We must be willing to demonstrate God's love to the community. That could come in the form of literacy development, primers, HIV and AIDS education, or even a sanitation project. Whatever it takes, as long as it takes. When it's time to start, the local translators are often the ones who write the first draft in their heart language. The team also creates footnotes and illustrations to help make the translation clear. The draft is revised and refined over and over again until they have a translation that conveys the meaning of God's word as accurately, clearly, and naturally as possible. But the checking doesn't stop there. Consultants and mother tongue speakers test the manuscript against the original Greek and Hebrew. There's a series of tests, often involving input from the local church, to check the accuracy of terms that are tough to translate, like grace and salvation. If the text needs major revisions, the team writes a new draft and the process repeats as often as needed. Hang in there, we're almost done. With an accurate, clear, and natural translation, scripture can be formatted in a way that is most useful to the community. Sometimes it will be a book that needs printing, or audio versions as used by Faith Comes by Hearing, or even a movie like the Jesus film, whatever form the culture is most likely to accept and use. Then comes the task of getting it into their hands, and that can involve a ton of logistics. This can mean shipping Bibles and audio players, setting up equipment to play the Jesus film, dealing with customs, and more. With scripture in their hands for the first time ever, the people may need help applying scripture to their daily lives. After all this work, time, energy, when you arrive at the end of the road, something happens, lives change, hearts transform, God's word becomes flesh and dwells among them for the first time ever, giving access to personal freedom and the life-changing message of Christ. So Bible translation, there's many ways we can be involved in it. You don't have to be a translator. And as you saw in the video, there's so many other ways that we can be involved in translation with the skills and the giftings that God has given us. If you're a manager, if you're a teacher, if you're a plumber, if you're an electrician, if you're an airplane pilot, Wycliffe needs airplane pilots. Uh, they have a great shortage of airplane pilots in the world of emissions of avi emissions aviation right now. That's a huge need. And, and so consider, how would the Lord be calling you to use your skills and abilities for, to serve him in missions? My role has been, with, I was in computer programming for 18 years. I, I graduated from Alec Tech there in computer programming in 1990, worked for Schwann's for 14 years there in Marshall, and that's how we ended up down there, and then four years for U.S. Bank. And during my time at U.S. Bank, I felt, we felt that stirring in our heart to do something for the Lord and do something with an eternal purpose that we could leave and touch and impact lives for, the, for Christ. And we had, uh, I, I was thinking about being a missionary pilot myself too, but when I called up a, a former missionary pilot, he said, well, what do you do now? And he said, I said, well, I'm in computer programming. And he said, oh, I wish I had your skills, because they could use you right now. You wouldn't have any further training. You could just go. 
And so we checked into that, and the Lord really opened the doors for us in 2006 to become members with Wycliffe Bible Translators and to use our IT skills for them. And since then, we have served remotely from our home in Minnesota while we cared for aging parents. They wanted us to honor our parents, and that was very important to, to Wycliffe as an organization, and they want us to be very much uh, family-oriented as well. And so we have been able to stay, work from home, and that my, that's my work computer right there that I use to connect with the office in Orlando. That's where the headquarters is. And using technology such as online meetings of Skype or uh, Google Hangouts and such, we can connect just like I would be down there. So it's been a real privilege to be able to serve here in, in that role. Now, they asked me originally to serve as a project manager. So I did that for several years until the need came along for a business intelligence analyst. And now that isn't snooping through people's hard drives either. But <laughs> that is, uh, when, when we do business intelligence, there's a need within an organization to be able to process numbers, uh, data to figure out where are we at with our different programs, how effective are we being, and to develop reports that will convey that meaning to them quickly and easily. Now, what is the first thing you do when you get into your car and you turn the key on? You look at something, don't you? You see, okay, is it down by E or is it up, right? <laughs> yes, your gas gauge. And that helps you make a decision. Am I going to get to my destination safely or do I need to, to, to make a change in my direction, stop and fill on fuel, and then be able to get to where I want to go? And so that's what business intelligence does for, for Wycliffe. Well, there's about 3,400 Wycliffe missionaries, Wycliffe USA missionaries that are serving all around the world. And so there's a lot of information needs there. One of those is within the uh, recruiting department to help them build capacity within the organization to reach that goal of Vision 2025. And so they've asked me to come alongside them to do reports and say, okay, how are we doing in our recruitment efforts? Where are our strong points? Where are areas where we need to focus? And we're getting the biggest um, bang for our buck. The effort that we put in is bringing recruits in that's going to people that finding people that have skills that want to use them for the Lord and matching them with positions within the organization. So it's a privilege to be able to come alongside these people and help them in that in that work of building the the, the resources needed for Bible translation. I'm so thankful for that. And sometimes I'll get, I'll finish a report for one of these people and they'll say, oh, I'm so excited about this. I can't wait to share my manager with it with my manager. Or now I know who to go to when I need another report created. So there's, there's joy in helping other people work efficiently and providing them with good numbers that they can trust. Now, I have a, I'm going to need some volunteers for this next one here. We've got some Bibles here and I'd like you to read from them, Acts verses, uh, chapter two, verses seven and eight. And I think Amber, you and you volunteered already for one, didn't you? So, so here we go. And, and I'll need someone to read it in English as well. Pastor Carl, let's have you start with that Bible there. Okay. Acts two, one, seven through eight, you said? Act, Acts two, verses seven and eight. Okay. La venida del Espíritu Santo. Uh, y estaban atónitos y maravillados diciendo, Mirad, no son galileos todos estos que hablan. ¿Cómo pues les oímos nosotros hablar cada uno en nuestra lengua en la que hemos nacido? Wow. Okay, so from now on, Pastor Carl's going to start preaching in that language. <laughs> <laughs> I see some heads shaking out there. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. What language was that? Spanish. Spanish, right. All right, now let's do the Green Bible here. Aber sich vor staunen reifen si die Lute, die Reden sind dach alle as Gale, gale. Uh, mm -hmm. We comment as the we see in user mutters rocken renden horen. That's good. Wow. Great. <laughs> the Norwegian you German were mix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what language was that? German. German. Very good. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's do the black one next here. The people all been stonish for true. They say all these people, yeah, that we, yea, that talk in different language. <laughs> they all come from Galilee, ain't he? How come we, yea, them that take in we own language? It's it's kind of this is this is the Gula New Testament. Okay. It is it is from a uh, it's an African culture that lives on islands off the coast of North Carolina, and there was so right here in the United States there's or there's even translation needs, and so that was that was determined by language surveyors that we needed to have a translation because this is what this is how they talk and this is how they communicate in their family life. And so this brings the word of God alive to them in their culture, right here in the United States. Amber. When blow their minds and make them think plenty, and they went tell, hey, the guys that stay talking, they from Galilee, yeah? Then how come us guys stay hear them telling stuff with their own kind talk? Almost. It's, it's also, it's a pigeon. It's actually Hawaiian pigeon. Uh, if you get off of the main, you know, touristy areas and back into the heavy-duty Hawaiian culture, you're going to hear them talking like that. And, and for us, it would be very foreign. We'd have a hard time understanding that, but that's, that's how they talk. And there was a graduate from the University of Hawaii that said, when I read the Bible in English, it speaks to my head. But when I read the Hawaiian Pigeon Bible, it speaks to my heart. Now, Acts 2, 7, and 8 in English. Do we have a, a, a volunteer to do that? Pastor? Acts 2, 7, and 8. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Ah, breath of fresh air, isn't it, huh? <laughs> Uh, I, I think, uh, Pastor Carl, we'll, we'll keep preaching in English then. Huh? Yeah, a little <laughs> okay. It's easier for the pastor, too, because oftentimes they'll struggle when they'll, they'll see the congregation. They just kind of like, uh, they, they phase out, fade out you know, when uh, they don't understand it in their own language. Prayer is also very important. Um, there was a fellow by the name of Fajak. He uh, was from the Tira speakers in Sudan. And in 1983, he had a vision of a man telling him to read Psalms 51. Now, he was not a believer, and he did not have access to scriptures in his language. So he sought out the help of a local minister to um, understand this, this vision. And the minister explained to him about Jesus and read to him Psalm 51. And in March of 1983, Fajak became a believer. Now, Wycliffe Bible Translators has a department called the Strategic Prayer Partnership Department. And I had an opportunity, my very first project, to work with this to help them with their computer system so they could track uh, people praying. Because people can sign up to pray for languages that are still waiting for the translation projects to go. And so being a part of that, this is near and dear to my heart. I got to know the, the leader of that department very well. And oftentimes they'll find when you're doing a translation, you're getting close to the end, the spiritual warfare is really increases as well because Satan does not want God's word to be proclaimed in that language. So a lot of things start happening when you get that one, two, three years out from a completion of a translation. So the, by the strategic prayer partners um, department here, project, they are the ones that encourage people to come alongside. They can sign up for these languages. Well, the Tira speakers here was one of them. And so this is this so wonderful to track how God brings people together at those crucial times. So November 1983, the exact month and year that the Bible People's Prayer Project in this department assigned a couple to begin praying for the Tira speakers. During 1986, they signed up another couple to begin praying for the Tira people. At that time, Fajak began studying at a Bible school, and there he learned about Bible translation, and he asked for help translating it into his language. But there were no translators available, and so he began doing some work on his own, and he translated some songs and some church liturgy, and eventually published a small book. Well, in March of 1990, Fajak met up with Bible translator Russ, and he was able to get a project officially started. 
And that was the exact month and year, March of 1990, that another couple was added to begin praying for this uh, tier of speakers. Podjock visited his homeland where the people responded positively to the translation and literacy work began. He translated Ruth followed by Genesis. During 1992, Fajak met and proposed to his future wife, Cece. Translation, um, there was a lot of resistance to that at that time because there was a lot of war going on in Sudan. And another prayer partner was assigned during, at that year to begin praying for the Tira speakers. And so vitally needed prayer was taking place at just the right time, strategic times during this language development project. Well, danger ex increased exponentially because of hostility towards Christians and the translation work had to be moved out of the language area. But it continued and eventually Sisi was able, was able to go back to the homeland and bring some of this translated scriptures. And when she read it to them, they said, where did Jesus learn our language? This book speaks just like us. Well, eventually in 2003, the Tira New Testament was drafted the Jesus film was produced in 2006, and in 2009, January of 2009, the Tira New Testament, Genesis, half of Exodus, and Ruth was officially dedicated. And when they have these Bible dedications, it's a big celebration because the first time ever they can have God's word in their own language. And it's, it's like a breath of fresh air, just like when we have it in our own language here. I'm going to share another short video here, um, and then we'll be wrapping up soon. God's worldwide purpose is to gather joyful worshipers for himself from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. There is something about God that is so universally praiseworthy and so profoundly beautiful and so deeply satisfying that God will find passionate admirers in every diverse people group in the world. English won't be the dominant language up there necessarily, nor Hebrew, nor Greek. No, everybody's going to have a chance to praise God. And every praise in every language is unique. Each language, the Masatec language of Mexico, can say things in a way that just leaves English sounding drab and dry. It's got a, something about it that's alive and vivid. And every language has a place where it's powerful and a place where it's just mundane. of the missionary enterprise is to be caught up in God's fuel and God's goal. And that means being caught up in worship. Why did God confuse the languages? It wasn't just to make things hard. Not at all. Every judgment of God results in greater glory to God in the end. Now how's the judgment of Babel going to result in greater glory to God? <laughs> in heaven. All these multiplied languages, 6,000 of them, every one of them, unique. No two of them say it in the same way. And they're all praising God. Alleluia. The great Alleluia. Chico was a friend of a translator, Wayne Hoff, in Guatemala. And one evening they were standing out on the, uh, the um, hillsides looking at a full moon and a starlit sky. And Wayne Hoff, knowing that men had once walked on the moon, said, Chico, do you know that men have walked on the moon? And Chico said, no, nah, that's impossible, it's too small. <laughs> well, Chico assured him it was indeed large enough to be walked on. And they continued to look up into the sky for a while. And then Wayne said, would you like to walk on the moon sometime? And Chico said, no, that's not what I want to do. And Wayne became curious. He said, well, what would you like to do? And he said, I would like to learn how to read so I can read God's word and I can know what he is saying to me.
We have some prayer cards and uh, things in the back, or down, actually down at the display table down below for you to, uh, to um, review, to take a look at. We need prayer partners. We need financial partners. We need ministry partners to come alongside us to make this possible so that we can continue in the work that God has called us to do. And there's, the prayer cards have an option to, you know, if you want to be a prayer partner, sign up and send that into Wycliffe. And that lets them know that you're coming alongside us in our ministry with Wycliffe. There's also an option to say financially, whether it's one-time gifts or ongoing gifts. Uh, you can you know, pray, as, as God would lead you, will you join us in doing the work of bringing the Bibles to those who are still waiting for it in their own language? As AFLC missionaries on loan, we aren't supported by the Wycliffe, by the, uh, the World Missions Department in their budget. So we're responsible for raising our own funds. Now those funds, if you, you know, maybe as a church, you would consider supporting us as missionaries. Um, please uh, let me know. Come and talk to me afterwards about it, because you can send it either straight into the AFLC World Missions Department, say for the ministry of Steve and Glenda, or you can send it directly to Wycliffe. And, and we also can specify that in your, on the prayer card as you would consider, how can I become involved in Bible translation? Because some are called to send, some are called to go, some are called to stay home and support through prayer, through finances, using your, your, what God has given you because you can't go yourself. So please consider that. Uh, we would also ask if you'd like to receive our newsletter, you can sign up for that. And we love emails because then we don't have any printing or, or postage costs and we can still get that message out. So leave us your email address and we can keep you updated with our quarterly newsletters. And uh, you can see what is God doing in the world of Bible translation. When we started back in 2008, well, 2006 as members and spent two years raising support, there was 2,286 languages still waiting, and now we're down to that 1,636. So it's an exciting thing. The greatest rate, increase in the rate to Bible translation that the church has ever seen, and we have the option to, uh, ability to be a part of that right now. I'd like to tell you about uh, Marilyn Laszlo. She was translating for the, uh, the Sepik Iwam people in Hana village of Papua New Guinea. And one day, a group of people came from a distant village, and some of them were sick, and they had heard that there was medicine in Hana. And so they came to, to see what was going on. Well, the headman of, of that group that came to visit Hana noticed that, well, they have a school here where people are reading and learning to read and write in their own language. And they have a church where they're worshiping, and they're free from the domination of ancestral spirits. And they're, they're learning to write, read and write. The villagers told them, this is a result of God's book. And so later, the, uh, the head man came to, to, to uh, Marilyn and said, can you come and give us God's book? And, and Marilyn says, I can't now because I've got many years yet to finish the work here in Hana Village. And, but he uh, said, well, could you send somebody else to come and visit us? And he said, well, there's, there's hundreds of languages still waiting in Papua New Guinea that and all of them still need a translation project to get started. So she said, well, could you at least come and visit us? And Marilyn agreed to do that. So the believers in Hana would not let her forget her commitment to these, uh, to this other, these other villages. And so they quickly organized an expedition. They went there to that village. And when they got there, Marilyn saw this new building right in the center of the village. And she said, she asked the head man, who is this? Or what, what is this here? And they said, oh, that's God's house. And she said, God's house? Is there, is there a missionary coming through? And he, she said, they said, no. And she said, is there a pastor coming here? And they said, no, nobody tells us about God. Well, then why did you build this house? She said, we believe that someday someone will come soon and tell us about God and give us God's book. We are just waiting. Now, is there, this, this will be time for question and answers if you'd like to do that. Um, do you have any, any questions? Uh, feel free to ask those, and I'll do my best to answer it. It's quite a process, yeah, because you'll run into languages that don't have a written form yet, so they have to develop the alphabet the way the people group wants to have it represented in their language because it's part of their culture, and it brings great cultural preservation when they get their language written down. It helps elevate them, and they can start to learn the laws of their country. They can have educational materials, medical help, can come quickly with uh, training and you know vocational training and everything. Yeah, yep. 
Good question. Um, when a language surveyors are first to go out and determine, is there a need for a translation in this language? Because is it going to be dying out in the next generation? Do they want a translation? So they have to go out and make those assessments there. And then they start building relationships. If there's a desire for it, there needs to be people from that people group that will work in the translation process and start taking ownership of it. And they're the ones that determine well, which, Bible, which books of the Bible do we want to start with. Um, oftentimes, Mark has been a very popular one to start because it's the shortest and least abstract of the Gospels. And Genesis is also very important because it tells us it's the foundation for the whole Gospel message is in the beginning God created and how man fell and how there's need for a Savior. So they will develop relationships within the community so that people will come alongside, take ownership of that. And Wycliffe will come alongside and work with them in something called the Common Framework, and that's where they determine the funding for the program, because sometimes they will have to, um, when a person is going to be involved in a translation project, they may have to leave their job and they need to support their family somehow, so there will need to be some funding allocated so these people can work on their, fund, on their translation project versus uh, going without, which wouldn't be a very good witness either. So um, they will work. Sometimes it's a pastor or a group of pastors that want to uh, do the translation project. So they can use that in addition to what they're already doing. Um, there needs to be allocation sometimes for uh, printing costs and for uh, um, you know teachers and those to come alongside and start doing language development and uh, literacy work as well. And, and there's also someone called uh, ethnomusicologist. It's a big, big word to describe the study of cultural music so that people can come along, get the, the hymns that they would like to sing in the style of worship that that culture already has uh, versus trying to bring our style of worship into their culture. It doesn't always fit real well. It, they can't enter into worship and, and experience that joy and intimate time with the Lord like we can here. We have our songs that we just love and it just really speaks to our heart. And so their style of music may be different. And so an ethnomusicologist will work with them to bring that along. Very exciting work. Does that answer your question? Any others? All right, good. Well, thank you again. Thank you uh, for, for inviting me here for the uh, WMF to represent that. We want to thank the WMF for your mission-mindedness and keeping missions in the church here and keeping it up front. And again, I invite you to stop by our display table. And uh, if you have any other questions, stop by and ask. Thank you.